of your precious minute. Uh, let me just introduce Paolo Manzoni, it's a colleague of mine, that will uh, t um, uh, tell you about um, the second, the very important meeting that our unit used to organize uh, every year. Okay, just a few minutes uh, and then we go to Magic Nick. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, on behalf of myself and my uh, big friend uh, Emanuele and Daniele Farina, the director of our unit, uh, welcome uh, to Torino as well. My, I would like to take uh, two minutes because uh, mainly maybe some of you know me as organizer on behalf of our foundation of the International Conference of Clinical Neonatology in Torino. We've been having already three editions in the last uh, three years. This is a uh, you can see scrolling down here in the slides the breakthrough and some uh, uh, basic data about the previous conferences. Uh, we have uh, some six, uh, seven hundred participants every year coming from all around the world. And uh, the, uh, the next edition will be, uh, will be held in June, next June 2013. It will be held again in Torino, not in this center, but actually in another one that is larger. You probably know that the proceedings are published in early human development, and uh, when I say proceeding, I mean also uh, invited abstract and uh, uh, research uh, reports. So every one of you who is keen on uh, getting back to Torino, on uh, attending this exciting meeting is uh, warmly invited to sign up and to reserve his place and also to send some abstracts to be evaluated. Um, one thing that uh, I would like to show you, it's uh, the preliminary program. Here you have one outside of the room in the tables. You have some copies. Please uh, feel free to grab one in order to go further in details in the preliminary program with the, uh, the names of the confirmed faculty and also the, uh, the topics that we'll be dealing. Needless to mention that we'll be having a, a, a very important and a comprehensive uh, neurological and uh, neurodevelopmental session. I'm happy to tell you that uh, Nick Koneman as well as uh, Professor Linda De Vries uh, will be uh, here again, along with Petra Huppi, with uh, Every Fanaroff with Eduardo Bancalari and many others that you can see listed here. My, uh, I am happy to uh, invite you, not only because uh, I have the opportunity to show you some things in, uh, in details, but also because you are already here. And uh, we were thinking uh, as organizers to offer you a special uh, registration fee in order to uh, enhance uh, your willingness uh, to come. So uh, you will see in the next slides that uh, uh, the usual fee that will not apply for you. The fee, the registration fee uh, is uh, for 415, uh, uh, 450 euros, but for you we will have a special 200 euros fee. So if you want to take this opportunity uh, we kindly invite you to, uh, to give, uh, to leave your name and your details for a contact to the scientific uh, uh, agency, to uh, the meeting planner, and also, uh, more simply, to uh, show up with myself or with uh, uh, Dr. Emanuele Mastretta in order to uh, mark your name and reserve your place with our meeting planner. Uh, one additional information, the meeting will be all in English, no simultaneous translation will be there, all the talks will be in English, and uh, along with the meeting uh, we'll be uh, providing you uh, also the welcome reception cocktail. So thank you very much, enjoy the conference, enjoy the symposium, have a productive work here, enjoy Torino, and hopefully we will see you again in a more pleasant season that is early June when the sun is shining and no fog is around. Thank you and have a nice afternoon. Sorry, a last communication. Um, um, I would like to inform you that we switched a little bit the lecture for tomorrow and Wednesday. 
So the lecture of Jerome Jager um, that was um, that was uh, that he would give would have given uh, the 28th on Wednesday on the simple approaches to the treatment of HIE will be done tomorrow, and uh, the overview and practical aspect of hypothermia will be done as the first lecture on Wednesday morning. Uh, please, Nick. Can I have my slides? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for coming back in the afternoon. And I'm delighted to be here, and I'm always honored to be invited. And um, I would like to thank the local organizing committee for inviting me back to Torino and, um, and also the trust that uh, Simbruna has in me of being able to teach you something about individualized care. And um, I would also want to um, add a disclaimer, actually, that uh, telling you about myself as a young a fellow in neonatology, I went to an Hippocrates meeting and I sat there in the audience, and we had smaller groups back then, and we would collect in a, in a farmhouse away from the city, so you could not go and be tempted to go shopping or sightseeing. And we would stay at this old farmhouse, and um, we'd have this, now, um, that's where I met Donna Ferrero, and I thought she was the smartest woman on earth. I was like so, you know, so, so impressed by her. And there was White Law and, 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 and Pollen I met there as well. And, and we would have dinner with them and go on the Rhine ride and all that. And I thought, wouldn't it be just amazing to be able to give one of those talks? And so here I am. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, please. Uh, um, so um, I'm going to talk to you about individualizing care. And um, today it will be an introductory. And tomorrow I'll be talking about family-centered care. And we will talk some about skin-to-skin uh, -skin care in that session. And the last day I will talk about implementing developmental care. And uh, we will talk about early feeding as to how, as a pediatrician and neonatologist, I think you're key and essential to be part of a multidisciplinary team and to be able to decide uh, how the baby should feed. But that's where we will be um, on Wednesday morning. Okay, this is where I um, work usually, and um, see if this works, yes. Um, this is the virtual uh, place, and this is the real place, and so when I come back next week, I will have to find the entrance again, because they're rebuilding and rebuilding the hospital forever now. It's in Rotterdam, and our unit consists of 30 beds at the moment, eight of them are high care beds, and the rest is intensive care. In Holland, we have a system that only 10 NICUs in our country are allowed to provide, uh, provide uh, neonatal care. And so hopefully most of our children born under 30 weeks are born in one of those centers. And once they are big enough, like more than 1,000 grams and more than 30 weeks old and no longer in need of invasive ventilation, they are sent to high care centers. So we have a high acuity unit and it's uh, very busy in our unit. And, and we service about 4 million uh, family, 4 million people in our region. and. Um, so it's a, it's a busy service. I do need to disclose that I'm also on the advisory board of Baby Bloom Healthcare, um, a company that is going to revolutionize the way we look at incubators. And I'm also a senior NIDCAP trainer at the Sophia Children's Hospital. And this afternoon, I'm only going to talk about this girl and about this girl. And these are very old pictures. This is actually Dr. Als doing an assessment of preterm infant behavior which is a, a neurological, developmental, and behavioral test or a, a way to get to know the baby. And um, this is the social part of the whole testing. And what she's doing, she's holding the baby, and the baby is looking in at her face. And what we see is that the baby has some muscle power, and unfortunately this is black and white, but I 
I do like the the image a lot, and supposedly the baby is smiling, and uh, even when we look at it, we have some happy thoughts, and then we get to this baby who is all who is the same gestational age as the previous baby, so they're both like forty two weeks post uh, conception, and this baby, well, you know, if most of us don't get an ah feeling when we see this picture we think whoa you know this baby looks different and, and and what we're going to talk about is why does this baby look different we see that the muscle tone is is less and the arms are a bit hanging and here the dr Els has to support the baby and then the baby can sort of afford to look in her direction and maybe do some of the tasks as eye following so this is essentially why um, the developmental work of Dr. Al started. So why are these children so different? And what happened with this baby that she couldn't be this happy, smiling, uh, invigorating 42-week-old um, uh, baby? This is a Jerry slide. I mean, I use it because I have sentimental values to it, but Dr. Els actually, dis she quantified the behavior that she was seeing in these two babies with the APIP, Assessment of Preterm Infant Behavior, which means that one is good and nine is poor. And the term baby, she saw 48 term babies, and, and they were doing significantly better than the babies born between 32 and 36 weeks who did better than the babies born before 32 weeks. So the phenomenon you just saw in the pictures, you were quantified in very early research of the early 80s. Petra Huppi in the 90s uh, was in Boston and she uh, made MRI scans of preterm infants at around 20 weeks, but she repeated the scans at term age and she also repeated scans, uh, she made scans of babies who were born around term. And she started to compare the uh, term baby brain with the premature baby brain and saw that the, and we can see it with the bare eye, of course, that the front part doesn't look as, as generous as uh, the front part here, which means that the white gray matter differentiation seems to be less, and she's actually calculated this statistically. And yes, it was true that this is less gray white matter differentiation. And you see here the myelination of this area is not happening in this area. So also the myelination of baby brains born too early is less than when they were born when they were born at term and um, this is the statistic and the article and they've all also added the APIP the assessment of preterm infant behavior and it was shown that the babies who had less myelination less great white matter differentiation also scored worse on the APIP so they looked more like the baby on the picture too so again why is this happening and if you want to to uh, hypothesize what could be happening you want to look at what what is supposed to happen what is supposed to happen in nature and of course we've heard about brain development this morning a very eloquent talk and and um, and i make it sort of simpler for me um, i i look at the brain development in three periods embryonic period so the first 56 days then the fetal period and the perinatal period. And for me, the big difference is really they're building the house and then you see the, um, the, uh, the neurons who are specializing and who are migrating. There's a neuronal migration going on around uh, between eight and, and 24 weeks actually, which means that the neurons that, uh, that start happening from stem cells, they migrate to the cortical zones and stay there the rest of their lives. And so the middle period is all about neuronal migration. And when everything is in place, the family moves into the house and they start using the house. So you want to shift furniture around you. And, and for the brain, that means that more synaptic connections are made and myelination starts. And also what I never really realized was that the brain sort of doubles its weight in that period, the last period when a lot of neonatologists are not really interested in, in neonates any longer, when they're, well, they're just growing. But actually, they're amazingly developing and their brain is doubling in size and the cortical folding is happening. So I really want us to, to appreciate this, that this is a very a crucial and essential period of, of development. 
And again, uh, Hüppi uh, eloquently um, simplified it for me and for us. And she took the first phase where you see that the, 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 the folding of the cortex starts happening. And around the 20 years and 25 weeks, you see this, this smooth uh, cortex surf, cortical surface that then starts rapidly and, and amazingly changing into this, this cauliflower-like or broccoli or whatever you wanted to call it, um, where the myelination is going on and the organization is going on. So for us, at, at the, as behavioralists, we were thinking, okay, so in the meantime, what does it mean? This brain is developing and what's going on inside that brain apart from oligodendrocytes being more specialized and hooking up to each other and neurons connecting. But how does that all happen and, and, and what is happening with that brain? And I want you to, to realize that when I talk about brain development, that, that I think all sensory experience uh, results in neural activity. So that the brain actually has some sensory input when, they're, when it's developing. And that the consequences are greatest. The consequences of uh, these impulses, of this sensory input, is the greatest when strong and unexpected experiences impact on the brain at a stage where it's so rapidly changing. So we go back to where the brain starts for me. And um, Pierre Gresson recently uh, stated that in the placenta, there are amazing growth hormones that, if taken away, will, will, will impede the brain to develop to its fullest uh, weight and, and, and development. So, you know, even the placenta is of use, and this is image. Uh, this is uh, this is information that recently came to us. So before we always thought, okay, if the mother is in good health, and um, if she is uh, receiving enough oxygen and not smoking and not drinking and not taking drugs, then this is the environment. And and we were just thinking, okay, and and also her rhythm, the day night rhythm, and her hormonal balances influence this brain. So in this whole setup, I want you to think back as this is what the brain needs. This is what the, the brain starts out developing. And then I wanted to know, so what is it actually that this fetus is experiencing? And I'm not saying that we know what the, exper what the experience of the fetus is, but we can hypothesize a little. Around seven weeks, the skin starts to have innovations that have uh, connections to this brain. And, and this is again so amazing that this starts around the mouth. And then at 10 weeks, the inside of your hand has innovation. And what it means is that there are, when something touches that phase or when something touches the inside of the hand, there are stimuli going to the brain. So the brain is experiencing something, just electrical, biochemical reactivity, but something is happening. And actually, you could even start playing a game because your hand is close to your mouth and you can do hand on, hand off, hand on, and off. So you can e even make the, move, make the input a little different at times and you can sort of experience what that is like. The brain can be geared up to, to this experience. And this is very old research um, where they took the embryo or the fetus actually and, and they tickled the fetus here is it's with a horse hair around the mouth and what actually happened is that they said the fetus was moving away so we can hypothesize that yes the baby the fetus rec registers the impulse and can also think about you know make this decision integrate this impulse and actually react and move away so, so Astonishingly, this, this also corresponds to how we later on use these two body parts, our hands and, and our mouth. So from early on, we've had this information coming to these areas, and, and the brain has the biggest surface area to correspond with these sensory and also motor areas in, in this way. So it is very uh, beneficial, and it starts quite early. And I always say that, you know, that important movement of getting your hands and going to your mouth, it's repeated and repeated from a very early age. 
So having said that, um, we also would like to, to talk about, you know, that it's all reflexes. Most of the neurologists say, oh, this is just nothing. This is a reflex, you know, it just happens and that's it. You get, get over it, get alive. And, um, but what uh, Benoit Schaal has so eloquently researched is that at 12 weeks, you can actually taste the amniotic fluid. So when your mother is Italian and she has a lot of garlic in her food, then the amniotic fluid will will have a lot of garlic in it and it will taste like garlic. If you deliver, it will smell like garlic in the delivery room. And um, Ben Waschal found a group of uh, French uh, pregnant women who lived in an area where they eat a lot of anise in their diet. So they're, they're constantly exposed to anise. And uh, he took another group of mothers or expecting mothers who never had any anise in their diet. And what they did after birth was present a cotton wool stick with some anise on it. And the babies of the mothers, and you know where this is going, the babies of the mothers who were eating anise were making significantly more mouthing movements. And the babies who were not used to the anise would sort of draw a face like you know what is this and the approach behavior towards anaise was significantly more in the babies who had been exposed probably exposed to the anaise in the womb and they've always also done two uh, stimuli one placebo one anaise and the anaise babies would turn towards the anaise side more often and and in the in the other group that was not used to the anaise they it wouldn't really matter so we're not only experiencing molecules, we're not only experiencing taste, but we're also starting to remember a little of this. So, and I find it remarkable that even inside the womb, you become part of mother's ecosystem, that her, her habits and the food she eats is all, already becomes part of your uh, preferences and your tastes. So even before birth, you're sort of embedded in that group. About movement and positioning, we think it's inhibited during the pregnancy because otherwise it might cause you to vomit. <laughs> no, seriously, we don't really know what's going on there. Well, I have not read up about it. That could be more to the truth. But um, auditorily, um, you know, I can say, of course, yeah, these babies hear stuff and uh, it's, it's, uh, you have to be careful what you say and what you do. But in a way, uh, we have to also think about when is this baby able to experience input. I'm not calling it hearing, but I'm calling it input just for a purpose, that the stimulation that comes from the cochlea that can occur around the 24th week, because that's when the cochlea starts happening. And amazingly, the cochlea, cochlea starts happening with low sounds. And when you look at the environment in the womb, of the womb, the lower sounds are, are more easily uh, going into the womb and you're, you're under the water and, and um, the, the, the sounds that have longer wavelengths that are, uh, penetrate more easily also through the skin and through the muscle of the womb. And so the male voice would be more easily heard and picked up. And I've, I'll come to that, I'll come back to that just a little while. And around 27 weeks, 96% of the fetuses respond with movements to a loud and 100 decibels is a really loud sound. And they've researched it a little further with all the new technology that we have. So with our magnetic encephalography, uh, we were able, we, I didn't do it, but they were able to research that when you present sounds to the womb and when you register the part where the sound uh, sort of activates the brain, it corresponds to the auditory cortex. So again, you see behavioral things happening with the fetus, but you also see that already in the brain, the specific uh, stimulus is happening in, this, in the part of the brain that will pick up an auditory uh, later on as well. So you're already learning uh, to use and you're already showing your brain where to store, where to uh, react and, and where to make sense of what's going on around you. So this is carefully thinking about around seven weeks, you have some, some sensations that come from around your mouth, inside of your hands, then suddenly you taste things. So the world just gradually opens up to this brain. So step by step, the brain is receiving more and more stimuli and organizing these stimuli to uh, make sense of the world later on. 
uh, we've already known about reactions to sound of, of term babies after they were born. Uh, this was research early on uh, that, yes, if you make sounds, the babies have big movements, they, uh, they have orienting to sounds, and, and, or they're, they're, they open up their eyes more, more widely when they hear their mother's voice, for instance. And they also have cardiac reactions. You can actually increase or slow down your heart rate when you hear certain sounds and especially the mother's voice is very uh, familiar. So the way the mother's voice, actually the baby needs mother's voice to develop its auditory cortex. Again, it needs the mother's voice to develop the auditory cortex. I mean, when people snide about NITCAP and they say, well, we won't be speaking out loud from now on, it is, the reason we don't like all the sound in the NICU is because if the mother talks to her baby, the baby will not be able to hear it. Her, the mother's voice will be gone inside all this, this noise going on around the baby. And it's essential that you know how to focus and to realize where is that voice coming from. So you have a localization. But when the voice just disappears and all the other loud sounds, you can't orient to it and you won't learn from it. And we know from, from very nice research that the, the auditory cortex of ex premature infants is actually a bit smaller than when you're born at term. So we do think that, that uh, this, is, uh, this is caused by the premature birth and by the noise. And uh, a friend of mine, a good researcher, Kathy Philbin in, in Philadelphia, she actually played uh, NICU sounds to hatching chicks, you know, the small chickens, and, and so they were still in the eggs, and she played all the sounds, all the alarms, and all the talking and everything. These chicks, when they hatched, were not able to orient to the mother hen, so they were not able to focus on who do I follow, and they were just running around the lab <laughs> everywhere, so they, their, their, their brain was differently uh, made up. Um, so we got to disclose that dad's voice, and, and in our culture, we often invite the fathers to talk to the womb and uh, to read stories, and, and this is part of the bonding process in any marriage. And, um, but the dad's voice is not remembered. <laughs> and this is also wonderfully, you know, it, it's, it's keen, because why should the baby remember a father's voice anyway? I mean, what has the dad got to do with the baby once it's born? So, <laughs> the thing is that 10% of the mothers don't even know that was the father. And uh, <laughs> so the thing is that after birth, the, the, the baby will remember the father's voice or the, the male voice that is significantly more present after three days of birth. If the father or the, the male has been with the pa baby, after three days, he will prefer to turn to that male voice. But before pregnancy, no. In, in Holland, we have this thing called a pregnancy bell, and the women are invited to wear it. In around the neck and in the disclosure it says please do not wear it in the last quarter of your pregnancy because it will increase breech deliveries because the baby will be listening to the bell the whole time and will not be able to turn around and come out and this is total crap because the bell has a frequency that is so high that you can't even hear it inside the womb so it's just a commercial joke I say this because uh, these days we do things like developmental care and we do foot soul reflex massage and an M massage and stomach massage and chanting and, and, and there's an anthropologist in our unit who wants to do music therapy and I think that, that we really need to always be critical as to what are we doing and is this really proven? I mean, it, does it make sense to do it? And so you want to be very critical and, and you want to ask yourself, what did Mozart's mother do? You know, in, in America, we're obsessed with intelligence and, and uh, we have something called womb college and you play all these tapes to your womb and so you hope that your baby becomes a genius. And, and we like to outsmart nature in a way. And I don't think that would make sense. I advise mothers, if, if they really, you know, if they think they want to do that, to, to sing a song or to sing the songs they like. 
and sing them over and over and over again during pregnancy. And, and we've known from research when, when you read the same story over and over during pregnancy, if you read that particular story when the baby is born, it will, be, it will alert more to that story than to other stories told by the mother. And um, I could go on about this forever, but I'll give you one more example of, of language and how the mother tongue um, needs to be there for the language of the baby. We th always thought that the babies were universal. They could be born and they could learn any language and, and they did not prefer the mother tongue. They actually do recognize mother's tongue and I still have Hugo, Hugo Larekrans uh, told me about this and I still haven't asked the, the slide so I can't show you, but I'll do an imitation. They've taken Swedish children and American children, the, I mean newborns, like two day, to three days old, and they've looked at the Swedish and American language about how is that different, and the vowels in Swedish language, like they're longer in American. They're so the this distinction between these two languages is quite clear to us. And then they put the baby in the in a central position and supported the baby. He's sucking on a pacifier and then they put headphones on the baby and when the when the baby the the, the, the um, Swedish baby is listening to the hurdy flirty murdy nerdy the baby's just passively you know, actively sucking away and then suddenly the American voice comes and you see the baby alerting <laughs> this is also something that I would like to give to you as to think about does the baby feel safe you can only develop, you can only further develop if you feel safe, if you feel confident, if you feel that you're being held, and that is essential in the treatment of babies, any babies, and also of children, of course, and of adults. If you feel safe, then you can explore your world and you can, can sit there and, and do things. If you do not feel safe, you will, you know, you will withdraw and, and, and you will be on alert. Okay. I'm going to rush through the visual system a little bit because I can talk for eight hours about visual systems. And, um, and we will listen for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> She's tempting. Um, now, the thing is that, that when the visual system, uh, one thing I want you, want you to remember, the retina, which consists of, of six layers, and, and they're actually around the 20th week, uh, biochemical reactions start happening in the cells of the top layer and they this chemical reaction will give reactions to the uh, other cells and the synapses and they are sort of trialing out what it is like to send a signal from here to there and eventually from the retina to the lateral nucleus geniculatus and and then to the visual cortex so in the womb through this random and, and spontaneous biochemical um, reactions, these signals are tried out and these signals make sure that the, the road and, and the way uh, these, these um, areas are formed are very meticulous and very neatly done. And this morning we heard about the cats who were, you know, blinded at birth. If you blind one eye and then you take out the, the lateral nucleus after you've done the experiment, you see that instead of these nice folds and this nice uh, setup, it's all messed up. And, and also their cortex is all messed up. So um, what we actually know is that when you're born early and when uh, the energy of light hits the retina, the retinal development and the whole development of the, uh, uh, of the um, visual system starts to change. And all the energy goes to the visual system. And actually, this impedes the further development of your auditory system as well. So you're not only doing uh, you know, half of your visual, no, not half, but your visual system is, is, is having difficulties developing and your auditory system is, is having difficulties developing. And we know again that um, the centers of the visual and auditory cortex are smaller in uh, newborns, in prematurely born infants. This, I find this amazing that this uh, picture shows you um, it's about a thousand pixels and it's and it's about a million different colors that you see here and your eye is able to see 10 million different colors so in order for you to fully appreciate it you really need a sensible uh, visual um, 
development. To, to, to take you along some of these processes, we have genetics, of course, that will influence all these sensory processes, epigenetic processes of, from which we are slowly learning how they might influence the whole system. The endogenous brain activity and the benefits have been quoted all many times that the sleep is so essential, but also ex exogenous uh, neurosensory stimulation is needed. So when a baby is born at 40 weeks, you need to be looking at the baby, you need to be interacting with the baby, otherwise the visual system is not going to develop. And we know this from babies who were neglected. And um, going a little through, um, so what does the baby need? What was this brain promised? The brain was promised the, the, the safe environment of the mother and later on the mother's body to be on the mother and the brain was promised a species social group because you know why why is a baby born at nine months anyways you mothers should know anybody why is a baby born at nine months right Otherwise, you know, it'd be much easier if they were two years old. They could go to the store, get some milk, and you know, and then you can talk to them, and they'll talk back. And but no, the, the uh, you know, the, the womb is so designed because we were going, we were walking upright, and and the pelvis has changed, and and the 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 size of the head and the pelvis is just the last moment of getting out. And so, what does this baby need to do to survive? What I'm saying is. How should the, ba the brain prepare this, this baby to survive? What it is, does it need to do? And um, of course it needs to drink and it needs to um, regulate his breathing and all that. But first of all, this baby needs to socially engage an adult. This baby needs to look really cute, where everybody says, ah, oh. and the midwife will put the baby on top of the mother, then biology will help a little by releasing oxytocin in mother and baby, so the whole dyad of, of motherhood starts happening more and more, and the bonding process will start. And this is essential because we are carriers. Uh, we, the baby needs to motivate somebody to carry them around, to save them and to help them in this world. Other mammals are nesters, for instance, and walkers, and then you have the marsupials, the, the kangaroos, or the, uh, they, who are born fetal, and they crawl up and they latch onto the mother's nipple, and then they grow. And this, this, this brain of the giraffe needs to recognize the mother's pattern and, and smell the mother's specific milk, and then follow the mother around. So this brain also needs to know how to walk. And, and these pubs are born actually prematurely. They can't see and, and they depend on each other for their warmth. The reason uh, this happens is because when you are born with so many brothers and sisters, there's only so many of you who can fit into the womb. So when you come out, then you, know, you need to develop further. And actually, uh, like, like apes, we, we uh, take a long time to develop. And human brains, uh, because of our prefrontal possibilities, are the brains that have become heaviest in evolution and, 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 and um, uh, are amazing instruments, of, of course. And Winnicott is, was onto this in the, in the 60s and 70s. Winnicott is a pediatrician and, and psychoanalyst for children. He said, there's no such thing as a baby. There's always a baby and someone else. And we also know it takes a village to raise a child. So then we get to the preterm infant and we ask, us, ask ourselves, what does the environment of a preterm look like? And um, there is, you know, remember this child needs to be inside the womb. So he needs to be with his friend, the hand that he's been touching and, and, and playing games with. And the other hand is, is gone. He, when he can't lift it because of gravity, the, the hand is 
gone forever. So, and the stimulus, if you open up the incubator, there's this cold air that you would never have had inside the womb. And instead of being in a round position, you laid out flat on your back. So the information the brain is getting at this moment is structurally different from what it's been promised, from what it should be getting. So the brain is, is registering because you cannot, there's no shut off button on the baby. So you can't just say, okay, for the next two months, uh, you're not registering. Now the baby will register everything. And you were inside your mother, so there was this beautiful symbiosis going on, and all of a sudden your mother is standing there, and, and you're no longer in contact, and sometimes you can't hear her voice, so this whole changes. And then there's this loving environment, who tender loving care and cares for you, and, and which is a myth sometimes in some of our units. So there is a sensory mismatch between the environment and the prematurely born infant. The environment is a different from what the brain was promised. And again, I'd like to quote Winnicott, uh, saying that babies are liable to the most severe anxieties if left for too long, hours or even minutes without familiar and human contact. They have experiences which can only be described as going to pieces, falling forever, dying, dying and dying, and losing all vestiges of hope of the renewal of contact. Um, falling forever dying, dying, and dying, and losing all vestiges of hope for the renewal of contact. And um, Sonny Arnaud actually quite eloquently put this all together for us scientists. He said that these babies suffer a dual stress in a sense of maternal separation and repetitive pain from the NICU care. And I would like to add discomfort to it as well, because discomfort can turn into pain eventually. And this changes the way the neural system uh, develops further in, in, in changing the biochemistry of your synaptic uh, connections, but also the amount of synaptic connections, the type of connections, it, it shakes up a whole lot. And um, we enter to um, my um, hobby, it's called NITCAP, Newborn Individualized Developmental Care and Assessment Program. And the way I look at these babies is that since the infant, they experience the world through their sensory system, like we've just heard about, and um, the way they react to it is an accurate mirror of what they're feeling or experiencing. And uh, Dr. Els has um, theorized a system uh, called the Synactive Organization of Behavioral Development, and it looks quite daunting when you look at it, but I'll walk you through it. There's an autonomic system, a motor system, state, and from this, attention and interaction. And we'll talk about it in more detail just now. And these systems are all in close contact. And we've seen an amazing example of the video where the baby had a strong autonomic reaction, a vagal collapse, uh, resulting in, in lack of motor activity or repetitive motor movements and, and, and a state that the baby was completely gone in a way. So this is how, within this system, we look at the baby's behavior. To, to make it more specific, the autonomic system consists of the breathing, the color of the baby, and I don't just mean pink or pale or blue. Now, we actually look at the baby and we go, the nose is a bit white and there's muddling on the chest or there's uh, some darkness under the eye. And so we look at it very specifically. And some of these signs for us as developmentalists are already sort of telling us the baby needs more support. The baby is not feeling safe and therefore discoloring. And uh, we stand at the bedside and then we look at the breathing. And, and most of us have never done that, just to look at breathing of the baby and see how the breathing goes. Is it regular? Is it deeper? Is it shallow? Does it stop? And I would invite you before, the, when the next time you're standing at the incubator, to just stand there for like 10 seconds and start counting the breathing and then open the incubator and then sticking your hands in and see how that breathing changes. Usually even standing at the incubator and lifting the covers, if you work with covers, already alters the breathing uh, pattern of an infant. And... Um, 
when you have when you look at the autonomic system we look at disorganization signals so we in, in popular times we say the baby has stress or no stress but we like to look at it as disorganized so when we see things like hiccuping or spitting up or gagging gas passing bowel movement straining all these things that some of us take for granted and think are normal we see these as disorganization signals that there is a mismatch that there's something going on where the autonomic system needs help and we of course like smooth respiratory a good stable color and stable digestion when we look at motor tone we look at the tone of the baby the way the baby moves and the posture the baby has and so this baby is is in a bit of distress actually um, it is severely disorganized <laughs> he's crying and but he his hand is near his mouth and he tries to bring his hand to his mouth and yet again the environment is so cruel that he's not succeeding so and hand to mouth movement is part of what we call um, regulation self regulation as you sit here you self regulate constant constantly to be able to pay attention and babies self regulate but babies whose brains are not able to self regulate yet need our co-regulation so that's why we need to look at the babies and see what they're doing how can we support this baby to self regulate because if certain behavior is happening, behavior is tied to all these synaptic connections. This, these, these, this, this behavior is tied to the way the brain functions. So in trying to get the baby to behave in a more secure and a more organized way, we hopefully also help the brain to develop in a more uh, succinct way. So when we look at tone, we look at a variety from hypertonic to actually flaccid and turning out. And, and tuning out is something I'm more afraid of than when they're still hypertonic and still moving a lot or straining and having this energy to protest in a way. And, and when they're flaccid, it turned out, it's like, you know, they've given up. So they, no, they have no longer have any energy left. What we look for in motor behavior is self-regulation, the hand to mouth, the foot clasping, finger holdings, uh, grasping, holding on to objects. That's literally how the baby self-regulates. And um, state is actually quite interesting. And I'm looking at you the whole time and I see state variation. And because of the hour and because of all these amazing talks you've had, it's quite difficult to stay in a state four. State four is the only real interactive state that we experience. In state four, you can take in new information. If I say something really ridiculous or if I make a joke, you can go into a state five, you start around, you laugh and you have more vigor. And um, if you go out on the street and you stand in the middle of the street here in, in Torino, you see state five happening around you instantaneously in the other drivers. And, and even a state six, when they really get upset with you and start shouting at you, and um, so that's day six. But I s also see that some people, you know, they've had a big lunch and they go into stage three and they, you know, they sort of drift away. And I try to scream at you, but it's OK. You can, you know, it's, it's you go into stage three or like in the morning, you have to get up at seven and the, the alarm clock goes and you're awake, but your eyes are not opening and you're thinking about the day and you're dreading getting out. That's a stage three. A stage two is a REM sleep. A stage one is knockout sleeping. And um, I'll take you to this little guy. Uh, it's day three. He was born at 29 weeks. His mother is standing on this side. She's uh, supporting him by holding him. And dad is over here trying to uh, measure his temperature and doing a diaper change. And the baby is looking out. This is a state four. And I want you to appreciate that this is hard for him because his breathing is constantly changing. The way he changes color is by having darker patches under the eyes and his cheeks and his nose will become whiter. So will his forehead. It's hard to see on the video. But his eyes are going round and he is in a state for his mother is talking to him, but it's costing him. Again, you saw that the motor system didn't, heal, didn't hold it and um, actually it becomes too much and he can actually shield himself from some of these impulses. And, but it's costing him. He's yawning now. So his autonomic system is, is paying energy to the fact that he wants to look out. He's hearing this familiar voice. 
And so again, he tries to, to, to get a notion of what's going on around him, but immediately he stops to breathe and um, making some mouthing movements, which are good movements, but then obviously he'll yawn again pretty soon. His breathing increases, his color changes the whole time. And um, actually what we should have done is stop right now and, and just shielded him, put him back in a side-lying position and make sure that he would be able to go back to sleep instead of filming on, instead of filming, filming and filming, because, you know, he's being stimulated by us. I'm all, I'm, one of the words I'm allergic to is stimulation. I think stimulation is not appropriate when a child is pre preterm because this child is still trying to take in all these sensory stimuli and doesn't need extra stimulation. And this child just needs some co-regulation when we try and help him back to go to sleep. And I always say that uh, the, best vo the best noise in the NICU, I'm just going to ask you, but I'll ask you tomorrow, is during kangaroo care, when the mother and the baby or the father and the baby have fell fallen asleep and the dad is snoring, and I call that the noise of brains growing. It's like, you know, secure sleep and, and, um, and the baby being able to develop further. And this is actually eyes wandering and the state system is, is really in need of some regulation. So when you look around you, um, you see that we can also regulate ourselves at the moment. Some of you are holding your head and the others are holding your body. And sometimes your foot, feet are on top of each other. This is all part of a self-regulation system that we still use as grown-ups as well. So... How do we look at the baby? We, we, we look at the breathing, we look at the, the state, and, and we see the way the baby moves. And then we sort of try to see, is the baby moving towards the stimulus? Is the baby moving towards what's going on? Or if the baby is moving away? And what do we like to do with it? What do we want to support? And that's the question we need to ask. One of the most difficult things of NITCAP is that we can learn how to observe the baby, but I cannot teach any one of you how to listen to that baby, how to say, okay, I need to stop now, because this is not what the baby needs. I don't, I, I've done my exam, but I should wait a while and maybe do the head ultrasound in the afternoon if it's not a medical emergency. I always say a medical emergency goes before anything. You know, you want to make sure that medically these babies are getting excellent and quality care. But you, when you do that, the next step is to make sure that the regulation of these, the environment of these babies is happening well enough. So before I uh, let you um, uh, go, is um, what I'd like you to remember is that NITCAP supports self-regulation, it prevents sensory overload, but most of all, it makes sure that the parents are in the unit, that the parents get to trust and to learn to know about their, their infant. One of the mothers told me that when I describe the baby to her and then she can see how the baby responds, and that she has a notion of, yes, that is what my baby is saying, that all the rest that I tell them medically as a doctor also makes sense because, I mean, I can describe her baby. So the trust relationship that comes from being able to be with the parents and being able to describe their infant uh, makes them trust their infant and makes them trust the system. Um, recently, uh, Als and all published this eloquent paper where they looked at um, uh, smallville gestational age children and they had two groups, a group of babies who did receive regular care and a group of babies that received NITCAP care and what they've actually seen, what the computer actually showed them when they did tractology and, and had the, the, the computer measure out um, the signals that it received from the MRI and sort of made this picture to see that the connectivity and the diversity of these connections were statistically proven more than in the babies who did not get any NITCAP care. And they always criticize us and say, okay, well, NITCAP is, is fun, you know, it's just for the unit. And after that, there are so many different impulses that will alter the brain development that the NITCAP effect will just disappear. Well, they have done, and this is still in preparation actually, uh, at the lab, the children who were in the initial research 20 years ago, 
were asked to come back to the lab and the ray ostrich complex figure means that you're asked to copy this drawing and for every single line that you do correctly you get a point you score so they had these are single individuals this is not the whole group but this is just an illustration as the knit cap uh, child and now a, a grown-up who was born at 25 weeks, when copying this picture showed significantly more detail than when the, when the child had not had NITCAP. After this, they take away the example and they ask again from memory to draw again. And you see that the NITCAP uh, baby has even more, still has more details than the baby who did not NITCAP, and by now a grown up. And then they go on with other testing and after 20 minutes they ask, do you remember that figure that you just drew twice? And then you see that the, the individual who had NITCAP was still able to score higher than the, 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 the individual who had, who had had normal care in the NICU 20 years ago. So you have one brain for life, like Emile Tisson says, and everything matters, and it kept his brain care, and I would like you to thank you for staying in an overall state four for most of the time. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much, Nick. That's too bad that I delivered a long time ago, so I would have used this information because this was really very, very beautiful. Now, may I ask you a practical uh, question? How does it realistically fit in a busy NICU? Right. The thing is that um, I will talk about this tomorrow as well, as when you're implementing this system, it should become second nature that, yes, you will take care of the baby more slowly or maybe you need to take care of this baby with two people so it means that you have to look at your system in a totally different way which means that instead of um, doing the care for every single baby in your unit at eight o'clock you want to think where is this baby at and what does this baby need right now so it needs negotiation and it needs teamwork so nurses have to team up and instead of doing one nurse doing three babies and the other nurse doing two babies these two nurses they take care of the five babies and between themselves they have to figure out the schedule and if you know that the cardiologist only has time at 10 o'clock then you just make sure that you're there at 10 the cardiologist comes and you support the baby baby during the ultrasound. It takes, um, it takes practice and also thinking outside the box, outside the system, which is very, very difficult because even in, in our unit where we say that NITCAP care is our daily care, um, to get the nurses to break away from 9.30 coffee breaks, it's almost impossible. <laughs> So throughout the years, we have implemented step by step. We've started first with light and sound. I took away the television set out of the unit. It became very popular. And, but also trying to, to give information as how important it is. But what I've come across many times, what I think is the Achilles heel, is to individualize to what I said, you know, I see the baby, I know what he needs, but am I willing to give it? Am I willing to go the extra mile? Is the system willing to support this? That is really a difficult process, and this is where it sometimes fails. And, and uh, I'm very realistic about this, and, and um, we've been, I've been working in, in the unit in Rotterdam for nine years, and, and people who come into the unit are shocked at the thing that it's so, it's, it's darker and it's quiet, and, and I don't think it's quiet enough yet. So we, you need to, to continuously think of, I always say it's like gardening. You know, you have your garden and some beautiful things are happening, but then you see overgrowth or plants that need to go. And so you have to stay interactive. We have the fortune of having uh, two developmental specialists there who can interact with the nurses in the morning, who can tune in and, and, uh, and do this program. And um, we've now uh, come to a point where we see that 
it's still difficult to individualize. So we've we've started to, um, and I'll talk about this tomorrow as well. As there's this model of how do you learn and teach people things, and and I must say that um, uh, presentations, you will only remember ten percent of what I said, and and, um, and 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 that's it. That's that's what we found out through research. If you do a presentation and a workshop, that knowledge goes to sixty percent. If you do a, a presentation, a workshop, and have continuous coaching, then you can get, reach eighty to ninety percent. Um, but it really needs solid coaching, and it and it's it's uh, it's not easy. And, and if I can, I have a, a last question because this seems um, seems difficult, but very very important uh, for babies that are um, healthy, premature baby. But how will you? How are you able to differentiate is a, if a shallow breathing uh -huh. is because the baby is uncomfortable? or uh, because the baby has a problem with the lung, or right. maybe if the baby looks sleepy. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we have the idea that every time there is a change, this means that the baby is sick. Right. And uh, we don't think about an uncomfortable, right. premature newborn. This is a very important question because when I first started out, and if baby w babies were deteriorating, I always thought, not enough NITCAP has been given to these babies. And uh, that's why I think NITCAP should be multidisciplinary and that some doctors should get involved as well. Because, um, and I would like to illustrate it with mothers, if they've been working with the developmental team, the mother is the first one to pick up on this subtle change. When the mother says, my baby is not my baby this morning, that's when we get a little anxious and that's when we decide, okay, I will check the baby twice instead of one time this today or uh, we will do this blood work and not postpone it or we will be on top of it and uh, we've also done for instance if we thought the baby was ready to come off the ventilator i've asked the developmental specialist will you look at the baby and see if you think the same thing a lot of nurses have this notion of i think the babies will do better off the respirator or mm, maybe we should wait a while and to to take that into account, but also to more specifically say, why do you think that? And that's when NITCAP is really practical, when you say, okay, we see that there is a strong motor uh, development, we see that the baby is able to tuck in quite nicely, so it means it has the energy to, to breathe and to do well, and, and then we can try. But I think you should always integrate the medical and the developmental, and, and, and you shouldn't become... Uh, uh, dogmatic, you know, it's like you should, some people they go for this developmental care stuff and then they go like, oh, it's not development, now you have to intubate, or that's really bad, or no, it's 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 just a give and take of, of the whole system, it's a very holistic approach. More questions? <laughs> yes, please. Has, has there been, sorry, has there been any um, studies done, and I know, I know there was the, the last couple of slides you did of the drawings are probably right. going in that direction about the correlation of babies' um, uh, affect uh -huh. uh, during during preterm or during normal birth, for that matter, uh -huh. and you know, kind of personality, behavioral development, and That's outcome it. because. It seems to me, and I'm not questioning it. Well, I am questioning, but, of course. It, it, but it's it, it's a question. I'm not questioning. It's just a question. <laughs> um, it seems to me that 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 what you describe is so um, intense in many ways, or or what we what we can do in the in the to a newborn normally can be so intense that the that the that the outcome would be dramatic, and mm -hmm. and. So, so can you help me with that? <laughs> um, I think there are a couple of questions in there that at one point you're saying, okay, is there a difference between boys and girls, for instance? How is there a genetic difference that we can lessen? And, and the, the, the overall quick answer is 
unfortunately, we have not been able to get the numbers of children to, to research the diversity. You would, what we've seen is not published that, for instance, the mothers who have post-traumatic stress syndrome and the mothers who have worked with a NITCAP consultant have less uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. But you need wider groups and larger groups to be able to do that. And this is very difficult. It would also be interesting to see if instead of 8% autism, you would be able to reduce that, for instance, uh, for premature infants. And, and um, uh, hopefully, the, uh, the uh, people who are able to visualize the brain will find ways to more intricately, more, more uh, delicately visualize all the tracts and maybe even the synaptic activity at one point. And that might make it more dramatic uh, when you compare groups of NITCAP and not NITCAP. And Heidi Lisa Alls did not enter the, the whole research in a way of let's see if these babies have less BPD or less IVH or are going home earlier or grow better. She, when she was doing this research, she wanted to know how the babies and the parents were bonding, how the development would go neurodevelopmentally. And then she looked at her data and realized that some of these babies had far less BPD. And then she thought, oh, all the, that was statistically proven and in a small group of babies, and it was published in YAMA. And, and that's when the whole thing started of, wow, there's more than just neurodevelopment. Also, the body uh, reacts differently when you have less stress or when you have less aggression around. But yes, I would love to see some of the research as to see if the personality changes, because I think when I, when I take it down in my outpatients, what I see is that um, when you have the newborns who come to my outpatients for neurodevelopmental evaluation, the, the children who were cooled, for instance, and who have a favorable outcome, at one year old, they come in and they have these eyes that say, I want the world, you know, bring it on, and I want to explore things, and I will get your whole uh, examining room upside down. Whereas the premature infants who are the same age, they look at mommy and they, you know, they're sort of trying and they're not as adventurous as their counterparts. And to me, um, the first research that would need to be done is to find a tool in which you can see, uh, look about, um, which you can tell about co-regulation and self-regulation. We know from Swedish research that some of the mothers at three years old, they were able to co-regulate their, their their child much better if they had been in a group of, of uh, where they had had NITCAP during the care. So the whole interaction and the personality formation, whether it's genetic, environment, I mean, that is, I think it's way too intricate to really decipher and we can still do the lumps in, a, in, in that way. And, and, and there's still a lot of work to do. Very exciting though. Okay. How much the overstimulation of one organ, like the uh, hearing or the eyes, affect the, the rest of the system and affect the hearing? I know there is some <coughs> explanation for that. Well, we, uh, what we know is that there is a group out there that was published about five, six years ago, where they have looked at teenagers who were uh, born prematurely and teenagers who were not, they were born normally. So, and they played um, uh, sentences to the teenagers. And when you've had, uh, when you were born prematurely, you needed more of the sentences, like they would filter out the, the, the last part of every word. And the babies, the children who were born at normal age, they were able to hear and they were able to put it all together, whereas prematurely born infants didn't know what was going on. So I, I always, when you look at the brain, uh, what we know from some of the research that's out there is that when, um, when your auditory cortex is smaller, you also have patches around your brain with auditory function. It's when you learn a foreign language, your foreign language does not go into the part where you speak your mother tongue, no, your foreign language just goes in other parts of the brain. It's stored there. And I compare uh, the life of a premature infant at the age of 15 uh, of you going to a cocktail party and having to speak a foreign language. And you have to really carefully listen and decipher these words. And, and um, so if that were your mother tongue and if you have to always sort of really listen very carefully, 
the chances of you becoming distracted and looking out the window and, and finding other stimulus is often what we see when we, when, we, when we look at the babe, when we look at the child, and we challenge it with the next developmental step, that if the child is not able to do it, they will divert away from it and do something else. So um, we, don't have the res we don't have that research where you, 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 you block one ear, of one eye, and then look at the brain and see how that anatomically has different has differed. So maybe in future, you know, you can sort of see when, you, when we can finally see the synaptic connections in your brain, we can start doing some of that research. But um, most of it is from animal research, and it's very crude. But um, like mothering research, how the, the baby rats, how, you know, how that happens. But for, for the grown-ups, um, I'm not familiar with a lot of research that way. I'm sorry, but it's exciting. Okay, thank you. Oh, there's a question in the back. There's some jogging going on around the room now. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. It's um, one of the most crucial things is between the obstetrics and the neonatologist is the bonding process. And like, should we give back the babies after we've seen them, after caesarean section, how early and so on. It, it's much more complicated in small children because we take them away from the mothers, we put them into the incubator and then go to the ward. Um, how much do you think this has the bonding process itself, so the very early two hours, influence on the development, on the whole, like uh -huh. the whole pr um, the process of the premature uh -huh. child? So, should we focus more on that, or do you think, well, that's a part of it, and let's go to NITCAP, which is more important? Well, I think NITCAP can already start before the baby's born in the way you talk to parents, future parents, in the way you explain to them what might happen if they deliver early. The way you interact with families is part of the way you think about uh, the development of the infant. I have some videos on my uh, laptop that shows in term babies something called the natural caesarean, which means that right after, during the, the caesarean, um, the curtain is, is lowered and the table is hired, so the mother is able to see that the baby's head comes out and the rest of the body, and then given a, a, a baby who is stable, the, the baby is immediately placed on the mother. We know from the term-born groups that the bonding is significantly better at one year, and we know that there's less depression in mothers who have uh, cesareans if you perform it that way. For premature infants, we haven't started to research that. What I do know is that it is a possibility, instead of taking the mother away and justifying this by saying, okay, this baby is premature, I've been at the delivery of 28-week babies who were very vigorous and, and uh, who were open eyes and moving around and breathing very beautifully and had a good color. Just putting those babies with the mother and holding them and staying with the baby uh, so that the baby and, and making sure the baby wouldn't cool off and having all the medical uh, support there. And what they're doing in Sweden and what we hope to be doing in Rotterdam pretty soon is, is have a, an, an ambulatory CPAP set, which means that after the baby is born, even at 28 or 27 weeks, if the baby is fit enough, then to, to put the CPAP on and place the baby with the father on skin to skin and then transport the baby on the ventilator, on the CPAP system, on the dad, so that the baby does not need to be separated from the parent. To say, okay, we've got so many children that prove that then the bonding will be better, no, that, that evidence is not there. So you're still justified to not do it. The only, the only evidence, if you can call it that, is, is the experience that the parents have and, and the things that the parents tell us that, that it enhanced them. But again, um, individualizing care means that not all families benefit from this. You know, the, If the mother is really anxious and afraid and then you put the baby on top of her and the only thing she can, she can do is panic even more, then this is not something you should be doing. 
but no, there, there is no concrete evidence that, that it might be better. And to quote um, uh, Nadia Bush, Bushweiler, uh, uh, a pediatric psychiatrist, and saying bonding, bonding is not a continuous process. Bonding is moments tied together. So even if you can't uh, have the baby with the mother right after birth, you can make sure that the environment after that or in the future can support the mother to be with her child. And, and I have some video of that too, as the, the first time the mother puts her premature infant to breast and, and, and having that experience. And, and yeah, also that, the whole bonding and attachment uh, psychology is, is very big at the moment and it's, it's, it's evolving. But no, we do not have concrete evidence of at least 10 seconds or an hour or two hours. And, but um, I think it should be negotiated and everybody should feel comfortable. And in the first place, the, the, the child medically and, and, uh, and in her systems and, and then the family and then the medical staff. But if you as a medical staff, you can't support it, you should not be doing it. So, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm not very dogmatic. I'm just saying, okay, look at the system and see what's possible and try things and, and see if it works and if you get positive feedback from the parents. And yes, I would love to research it, but it's not happening at the moment. Thank you. Thank you.